This week's guest is Rob Doyle, who is an author of three books, the latest of which, Threshold, has just been reviewed by the New York Times. In this podcast, we talk about psychedelics, the writer's lifestyle, and a profound encounter outside the Metropolis Festival in 2015. Um, I hope you guys enjoy, because we really enjoy it. All the best. Hello, friends, and welcome, Rob Doyle, to the podcast. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, so believe it or not, Rob, this isn't the first time we've chatted. Okay, <laughs> tell me more. Uh, <laughs> so do you remember the Metropolis Festival, I'm going to say 2015 or 2016? Yeah, I do remember it. Yeah, I was yeah. there to talk about presumably my books. Uh, I have fairly vague memories of it, to be honest. Yeah, but I was there for sure. Okay, do you remember... Do, do you remember having a stimulating conversation with a man outside while waiting for a taxi? Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> You're going to tell me you, you were that man. I was that man. You were that man. Okay. Yeah. What did, that, we, yeah. What, did, what did we converse about? If I remember correctly, This Is England came up because I thought, I thought you were telling me you were spending some time in England working on a film. Right. Yeah, I, I was. I was. Okay, um, and I just remember This Is England came up, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't know if you'd remember that, but I thought it was funny. Yeah, yeah, right. Just to, uh, so to start off, Rob, I was just going to ask, um, when did you start, uh, when did you be, uh, make the decision to kind of dedicate your life to becoming an author? I would say I had started to feel my way towards that decision from, you know, the time I left college, really, when I was in my early 20s. But the decision started to solidify into a conviction, a real determination, I would say, in my mid-20s, um, at which point I had kind of done a fair amount of traveling around the world and all this stuff. And... Um, kind of realized that it's it's time to go at it you know now's the time it's not it's not in the future it's now and so i uh spent i yeah then i really threw myself at it you know i wrote a, a first book which um i never even attempted to publish because it wasn't good but it was uh mm -hmm. it was the first it was the first try and then by the time i was when i was 27 i wrote my first novel or you know the first draft of my first novel here are the young men, my first published novel, um, and then spent the next few years trying to kind of bash it into shape and also try to get it published. So by that stage, I was on a fairly ruthless, relentless kind of inner jihad trying to uh, assert myself on the world as a, <laughs> as a writer. Yeah. Okay. So, and it, was there a difference in time periods between when you – dedicated to yourself to becoming a writer and when you started to call yourself a writer yeah absolutely that's a good question and uh, that's a that's a question that a lot of uh, writers will 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 resonate with in that it takes a long time and rightly so i think for anyone to be able to call themselves a writer um i mean sometimes sometimes you know when you're up and coming and you know you're you're kind of trying to make it and you're trying to write a book or whatever and no one knows who you are and you don't even know if you're any good but you think you might be sometimes you meet other people in the same situation who shamelessly and without any discomfort whatsoever call themselves a writer and you know in most cases they're kind of crap or they're not very good you know uh so <laughs> I think for me, it took me a hell of a lot. I think, you know, I kind of knew that you need to wait for other people to call you a writer in a sense. You know, you just have to keep turning up at the job and keep producing stuff. And eventually uh, you'll find yourself in a position where you are comfortable to say I'm a writer. But it takes years. And I don't even necessarily mean as soon as your first book gets published. I mean, it can even the kind of sense of, um, slight embarrassment around the word. I remember Seamus Heaney talks about calling oneself a poet and being called a poet. And he says, it's a praise word. 
you know, poet is a praise word. And I think writer is a little bit of a praise word as well. And hence yeah. the embarrassment of uh, labeling oneself as a writer. It, it can sound a bit like you're blowing your own trumpet. Um, but I find even now, you know, I'm very, I would say, um, kind of comfortably in 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 the job you know I'm, I'm i'm fairly i'm happy with what i do and all of that stuff but even now if somebody asks me what i do i tend to say i use the verb rather than the noun i tend to say i write rather than i'm a writer it just it just sounds a bit mm. less pompous you know i feel like less of a dick when i say that <laughs> and was, sorry Sam, go ahead go on I was going to ask, um, when you wrote your first book, um, was there then a fear that maybe that was it, that that was all your creative juices used, and then you would, that, that would be a one-hit show, a one-hit pony, and then that would be it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, th- there's always that, I feel. You know, I think every writer kind of writes each book um, fearing that it might be their last, uh, and that includes your first book. And you think, shit, this is the story that I had to tell. You know, this is all the passion and the emotion and everything I had to say and feel has gone into this book. So where is it going to come from next? But of course, it does come because you keep living and you keep alert to life. I mean, of course, there are plenty of writers who stop after one or two or three books. Um, But I... uh, I, I did worry about that. I wouldn't say I lost sleep over it, but I it did occur to me, you know. But uh, yeah. I, I tend I tend to be a bit more relaxed about those things now. I just kind of trust in the process of life uh, to uh-huh. keep mm. filling the well, you know. I, I I tend to stay fairly inspired. I mean, I have lots of downtime, you know. There, I go through lots of periods where I don't write anything. I really don't. I'm not the kind who forces myself to get up in the morning, sit at the desk and bash out 1,000 words uh, regardless, you know, even if I have nothing Uh burning to say. In in those cases, I think it's best just to keep quiet, you know. By all means, you know, scribble in your notebook, take notes. But um, I think passivity, inactivity, um, receptiveness, I think these are all crucial for uh, for artists as well as activity. I think too much activity can make you kind of uh, a bit something. Something starts. Something is lacking sometimes if you just keep hammering away at it. I get you. Mm. I remember reading an interview with uh, Ziz Ansari, who had just finished uh, writing the second series of his show. Um, oh, I forget what it's called now. It was, but he was saying, you know, immediately when there's a series and it's a hit or the same when it's a book and it's a hit, the publisher right. and the company is like, all right, we need to strike when the iron's hot. D- did you feel any of that pressure? Uh, yeah, I, I always do. You know, I think especially with the first novel, you just you desperately want to impose yourself, inflict yourself on the world and you have so much to say and you're kind of raging and you know your book feels so relevant and all of that and then the publishing world is just so slow it takes such time for everything to happen that you're kind of cracking up you're pulling your hair out thinking this is the moment what are you waiting for you know look at what's in the news look what's happening this book is so relevant and all that but of course that kind of comes and goes and uh you know i don't think books are these topical kind of in the moment thing so much anyway. I think it's, um, I, 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 I tend not to worry too much about that. You know, like the, the book, I've just threshold my latest book. I spent a good uh-huh. couple of, you know, three, four years writing it. And um, it wasn't that I knew it was a hit, but I just knew I was onto a good book, you know, and that kind of gave yeah, me the sustenance. Yeah. It wasn't so much a blazing need to have it published right now, the way might have been the case with, say, my first book, it was more just a sense that, no, this is good. You know, I'm, I'm happy with what I'm doing here. And whenever this comes out, I think people might respond um, passionately or favorably towards it. And they did. I get you. And, for sure. Um, and do you think then your own personal kind of measurement of success has changed? 
over the last say six seven years because you sound a lot more um at ease or like the, the way you're talking reminded me of i remember uh, brad pitt was saying that when he finished fight club that he was just so happy with the movie uh, like he just felt on set that they were just doing such a good job they were making such good art that he didn't really care about the reception and i don't know if you remember but fight club was a bit of a flop in the cinemas well and um, yeah yeah uh, do you think that you personally uh like have have you always felt like this it's like no i just need to feel about good about the art and then if people praise it they do and if they don't they don't uh, no, I think, though, when you get to that Brad Pitt um, post Fight Club state, it's a very happy and even wise state to be in, you know, because um, you you could really crack yourself up and you will crack yourself up if you're constantly obsessing over some kind of um, insatiable external validation that you depend upon for your feeling of yeah. uh, having done done a good job um and so and, and i mean it's 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 incomplete i'm not sitting here like i'm the buddha of all wisdom and you know serene all the time you know i get moments of uh yeah why why didn't i win that prize or you know that other <laughs> author uh, jealousies and uh you know there's a lot yeah. of that going on all the time um but but you know you you, you have to just like I said, you crack yourself up if you let that get a better of you. So you just kind of learn to see that as a kind of petty, silly, childish kind of thing. And um, I think it's probably just like so much else in life. You know, you get better at it as you get older, which is probably to say that you just get so exhausted and worn out by being crazy all the time and miserable all the time that you start <laughs> yeah. in desperation looking for a wiser sane or a way to go about things and i think um uh, one's own attitude towards success literary or otherwise is uh, is is in that category mine included rob um i saw in one of the interviews that you've done that you kind of spoke that you ha- used to have like content for people who only sought happiness, but now you're kind of um, you're in that place as well. But that in your talking about your younger days, that you said uh, in an interview that you got sick of being fairly radically unhappy. Yeah. Um, do you feel like you ever like indulged in that for the sake of your art like writing? And if so, was it? Do you think it's actually necessary in hindsight when you look back on it? I don't think I indulged in it. No, but I do think that. Um, I probably thought, well, insofar as this is happening, uh, I may as well make the most of it. And by that, I mean somehow aestheticizing it, you know, turning it into art. Um, And I I don't think that's a a bad thing to do, actually. You know, you're you're thrown into the world and you're dealt the hand that you're dealt. And um, it's, it's tough. And um, it's not an easy ride by any stretch. I don't think for anybody, you know, that the mm. basic conditions of existence are fairly fraught. And so um, mm. you kind of, I, I, I think it was, I mean, I, I think anybody who's, you know, read my books is not going to be under any illusion that I've um, had what you would call plain sailing kind of ride through life, you know, that it's been uh, cloudless and unblemished and, um, and cheery all the time and so on. Uh, Not that there's not a lot of mirth and humor and, you know, tenderness, all that stuff in my books, but there's a hell of a lot of anxiety, madness, chaos, destruction, torment, all that stuff, Mm. all the juicy stuff. Um, and I suppose what I was getting at in that interview was that, you know, I used to kind of believe almost fanatically, almost in a kind of fundamentalist way that art was enough to redeem all of that um, agony, misery, all that stuff, which then thereby takes on a certain kind of romanticism, a certain glamour in that it's you know, art bestows its kind of favors upon it. Uh, But then, you know, you get older and it's just, again, things are just kind of grinding you down so much and you, you, you just kind of getting a bit punch drunk and you start to take weight to really 
has to be some sort of some sort of middle ground here, some sort of balance um, that 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 may be as profoundly meaningful as the creation of the art and the writing of the books is. Maybe it isn't enough on its own to redeem to um, to to well, yeah, to redeem all the all the, the dark stuff. And so, mm. and so, you start to look for ways to become a bit more sane. And I guess that's where I've been the last year or two. Year or two, you, yeah. I saw that you mentioned with your interview with Curse of Murphy that over the last two years, in particular, you felt that there's been a lot of personal development for you. Was was this kind of realization the anchor behind it, or kind of? I think. Um... I think if I'm honest about it, I think there's more of an element of desperation to it. You know, I think um, I always felt people, you know, that the the obvious thing you hear about is the, the midlife crisis that like guys will tend to go through in their whatever 40s or. Um, but to me, it always seemed a bit suspect, even a bit laughable, because life has just felt to me like one perpetual succession of crises. <laughs> and, um, so. A couple of years ago, I very much found myself in the grip of one such crisis, which was really, you know, just maybe the tail end of a crisis that I'd been kind of surfing over the last three, four years and creating a book from it, which is Threshold. Um, And uh, then, you know, you get to the end of the book and you're kind of exhausted and battered and weary and you're kind of going, okay you're no longer kind of distracted and focused on the creation of a book. And so you start to look at the conditions of your life as you're living it. And you start to think, no, this is, this is all a bit, uh, this, this, I need to change a few things. So yeah, I suppose in the last couple of years I have been, I feel like I'm having the kind of revelations in my late thirties that, you know, everyone else has probably in their late twenties, if not in their late teens, um, basic you know uh basic sustenance and and um sane approach to living stuff but that's where i am now nowhere nowhere near um complete harmony or anything like it uh just a bit more open to the possibility that i might i might be able for it you know i I suppose when i was yeah yeah, I suppose in the past, being very extreme of of a very extreme cast of mind, I probably sensed or suspected that uh, just that that chaos and turmoil and all that stuff were just kind of how it was always going to be for me, my lot in life. But uh, I've just decided to bring that up for question a bit more. Mm. Rob, you talk about. Um the balance that you've like kind of found now, but maybe the extreme personality that was um, kind of formed maybe your earlier days. And there's a one of my favorite quotes, which I stumbled across, which I know Jim loves um, where you claim that using ketamine in Kashmir was, and I quote important research at the limits of consciousness, but I see now I was just getting fucked up on a boat. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, th- I, th- I think that's interesting because at uni- uh, for my university years, especially, and I'm sure for many others, there's a lot of experimenting with like party drugs or rave drugs or hard drugs, however you want to call it. And um, like ketamine, some only had the value of the high they delivered, but maybe some others, you know, did have um, kind of a valuable change on on my outlook and my kind of consciousness. Mm. What did you believe that there were any other drugs that you experienced, maybe not in Kashmir, but um, that had changed your outlook or, or your consciousness? Yeah, I do. Um, I would say, actually, here's the thing: is that despite that line, you know which uh, obviously I was partly playing for laughs. So I kind of do still feel that I've had some fairly um, startlingly interesting experiences on ketamine, maybe not in Kashmir because that was, that was all very extreme, but even more recently, uh, ketamine is a very, very interesting substance, but also things like MDMA. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I would almost say that there isn't really a drug that I haven't, at some time or another, had uh, some very peak experience, memorable, and at best cases, consciousness um, 
enhancing, consciousness modifying, uh, philosophically rich experience. Everything from you know MDMA to particularly the psychedelics, which I, I write a lot about in Threshold, mm-hmm. uh, magic mushrooms, mm-hmm. uh, LSD, maybe to a lesser extent. I've somewhat less experience with it. The DMT, ayahuasca, particularly those plant based um, uh, natural psychedelics. I've I have. Yeah. I, I don't really take um, any drugs these days uh, very frequently at all. I'm kind of living in a pretty uh, solitary kind of uh, work-focused world at the moment. So, you know, I'm not. it's not like I'm out there kind of caning it. But uh, that said, I tend to have a fairly almost unreservedly positive um, attitude towards the plant psychedelics, uh, magic mushrooms in particular, maybe they, they've had, did, I've had did any of those, experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Did any of those in, um, influence your writing? What I mean by that is more kind of directly because you know, there's, you always hear of these famous writers, Hunter S Thompson probably springs to mind where he would, he's kind of known for at least at times writing under the influence. Has, has that ever been part of your kind of, um, your work your working way or has it kind of just been more of a research thing and then you come back to it into your writing afterwards yeah i mean i have tried the former i have done it you know on various um, substances but it, it doesn't tend to yield very positive results in my in my uh, experience <laughs> uh i would i would say at the most i could get out of a kind of uh writing on drugs experience would be to take a f- couple of notes, you know, to jot down a few ideas and then, right. and then extrapolate upon them the, the next day uh, with the sober, clear mind. But generally, no, no, you, you won't see me, um, you know, like necking a pill and sitting down at the, at the laptop. It's the last thing. <laughs> uh, even, even trying uh, to, when I, you know, I've tried this before, but when I tried to, like, if I'm, take an LSD or mushrooms or something. And I tried to write, it's just beyond me. It's completely beyond me. I think it's because it demands a certain quality of concentration and focus and rationality, which is almost Mm. the opposite. Yeah. It's the opposite to what I'm experiencing on it, which is this very diffuse, very lateral uh, kind of drifty um, experience. It almost uh, trying to then, it, language is like a bringing down of the experience, uh, a dilution of the experience, and it just doesn't work. The, mm. There's a section in Threshold Rob where Rob, the character, I forget which substance he's taken, but then he mentions that the illusion of separateness has been lifted. Have, have you ever experienced the illusion of separateness being lifted without these substances? Yeah, um, and actually, I believe that the section you're thinking of is not actually a drug uh, experience. It is, I remember exactly what it is. It's at the end of the chapter, Knife, where uh, he has had a kind of near-death experience at the hand of two guys who who mugged him with a knife in Paris. Yeah, and then he goes back and dreams of his own death. But of course, the dream is, uh, it's it's a beautiful, uplifting dream because death, in this kind of Eastern sense, it's not this terrible, bleak end of everything. It's just a, it's a transformation. It's the end of an illusion of separateness. And I, yeah, I would say I have had um, what what Freud calls this oceanic experience um, various times in my life. I, it's hard to think of specific instances, but you know, drugs weren't always necessarily involved. Um, ecstatic experience be it through music through um just i guess through overwhelming feelings of uh of 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 love even can can induce something like that you know um through meditation um i i like i say i can't think of any specific instances but i just know that i've had variants of that experience which the mystics tell us all the mystics, whether they're from, you know, the Sufi Islamic tradition or from the Buddhist tradition or from whichever part of the world, they all seem to be pointing towards the same experience, which is the illusoriness of a separate, isolated selfhood and mm. the um, 
the interconnectedness of oneself with all that exists, and therefore, in a sense, the, the deathlessness of everything. Um, even Schopenhauer, you know, the great atheist, was all about this. And so I guess I'm always um, trying to find ways to get at that experience, be it through writing, be it through actually, you know, my own lived experience, be it through drugs, although, like I say, not not so much now, but certainly in the past, um, even sexual experience, you know, can be somehow a, a stab at that, at that, uh, that oceanic the loss of self. bliss. Yeah, exactly. The loss of self and the fusion of self with something beyond the self. Yeah. It's a fine line here. You know, you are kind of on a knife edge because loss of self can sound, even when you say it, it, it on one hand, it can sound very liberating and very um, euphoric and benign. And on the other hand, it can feel terrifying. It can feel, it could be psychosis, you know, like psychosis is a kind of loss of self, a shattering of self. And so I suppose I've always been um, walking on this kind of knife edge between uh, the transcendental loss of self and the utterly catastrophic loss of self. And I'm sure I've experienced both of them um, Mm -hmm. more than once. Yeah, you're dead right to make that distinction. Actually, I hadn't really thought about that, but you're you're certainly right. Um, have have these experiences and like these teachings or these readings have they changed how you look at life then and subsequently death? Yeah, yeah, they have. Yeah, I mean, not not that I have any um, final answers. You know, I feel like um, I guess one aspect of threshold that I think people probably respond well to or that they like is that it's by no means some kind of guru figure setting himself up as a, as a fount of wisdom and a, you know, a, a receptacle for all the final answers. It's a confused kind of consciousness stumbling through the world, more or less haphazardly trying to, um, trying to figure out some basic stuff. And that's mm. pretty much me as well as the the Rob in the book. And so, but that said, and so, so I would say I don't have any, you know, conclusions. I don't have any hard and fast answers about these big questions, but I would say that, yeah, all of my combined explorations in reading, in, uh, in, I guess, explorations of experience and uh even my kind of investigations of the wisdom schools let's say this the spiritual traditions have given me certain basic directions of forward motion let's say rather than uh firm answers you know even the question of uh of 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 a life after death of something that survives us or of death itself you know i used to be a very you know i kind of was educated into that very brutal almost macho hard materialist kind of nietzschean existentialist school of thought whereby we're all in this mechanistic brutally physical material universe and that's all there is and you know, everything is essentially meaningless and there's only the kind of hard laws of immutable science and so on. And, um, you know, I kind of fell for that hook, line and sinker. And then subsequent investigations and experiences and um, reading even uh, and reflections have made me very seriously doubt all that. You know, I'm not, I don't feel I'm in that ideology so much anymore. It just, it seems to me now like a bit of a kind of, a kind of a narrow dogma and so i'm far more of a kind of almost Mm. a kind of a kind of agnostic about these uh, ultimate questions which is a very rich fruitful place to be in i find it's far less hopeless it's far more open-minded yeah yeah Yeah. rob is there um you talk kind of um, a lot about your traveling and you're kind of a, uh, you're a serial traveler and you've spoken about Eastern thought processes. And is there a particular culture or country or people that has had um, a really tangible influence on your outlook on life? I would say, well, first of all, I would say, you know, I don't, 
I'm a kind of decadent Westerner, you know, with a kind of a shoddy, um, you know, haphazard uh, knowledge of these things. But I would say, so I don't necessarily subscribe to any particular religion. You know, I've been formed by this kind of murky, mucky consumer culture, just like the rest of us. And so uh, mm. it's kind of limited what I feel I'm able to achieve and experience in these terms. But I would say that said that uh, the Buddhist culture, philosophy, um, practice is still something I have a profound, a really great respect for. And that's something that I took a, at a certain point uh, when I was in, my, and I, there's a whole chapter about this in Threshold. I took a real interest in it having learned to meditate at a Buddhist center in Dublin and uh, just spent a couple of years really fascinated, you know, um, uh, reading everything I could of Buddhist texts and then going out to Asia and kind of just wandering around, staying in Buddhist monasteries and meditating all the time and all of that. And, you know, because of my kind of flabby hedonistic habits that they eventually kind of, came back and you know i drifted away from all that stuff but it definitely it was definitely a, a life ring you know like you're, you're drowning and someone chucks yeah. in the life ring that was definitely a life ring for me and even though i drifted away from it and i would certainly not call myself uh, a buddhist i still have friends close friends who are very much in that world and yeah like i said it's still a culture a tradition even a body of texts and of art that I have a, a real love for. Do you think that it's changed your view of the artistic process? Um, for instance, I was reading a uh, Damien Dempsey interview a few days ago, and he was talking about how Christy Moore told him that he always thinks of the songs just coming through him, like him just kind of being a vessel for the songs rather than him being the, the creator of the song. And do you think, or do you feel a similar way when you're writing? Uh, I do. And I don't, I, I'd like to say I do because that strikes me as uh, a kind of noble, uh, honorable, um, and wise approach actually, you know, um, and I think, yeah, it's the, like the Zen idea that the whole Eastern idea that the more you can get the self out of the way, get the ego out of the yeah. way, uh, the, the more the real stuff is going to flow through you. Um, but I think in, in my case, it's a bit more complicated in that some of the art is, you know, playing with, uh, notions and images of selfhood and of, of, of ego and kind of sending myself up and also aggrandizing myself sometimes and then assassinating myself other times. Um, but I do feel, I would say that they're, yeah, at the best, like I'm writing a lot at the moment. I'm very kind of in a, in a nice little, um, and I'm in a nice little kind of groove at the moment. And I, I do feel that there's a pleasant lack of when you're really in the flow of it, it's just this process that's happening, you know, and you're just letting the process take over. Uh -huh. It's like when you see a sports person and they're in the zone. An underground artist once said, or an underground artist called Kanye West once said that when I want to express myself, wor words often get in the way. D right. Do you find this also when you, we, we, like when you're trying to talk about these such profound experiences that like words, yeah, you can give people a, a kind of, an idea of it, but it's so hard for them to become anywhere close to really understanding your experience through these words. Or do you feel like sometimes like, or is that your job as the writer that, no, I have this ability to really put it into their mind, how I'm experience or how I'm, my experience is. Yeah. I think that, I think that in a way, both of those hypotheses are correct. And um, what I mean by that is when I, write something um i i know i know that it's only a kind of uh you know cave painting it's only a, a it's only a kind of paltry rendition of something ineffable and uh, be, because you know there's there's just this fundamental difference between language between words on a page and um 
the extreme subtlety of any experience. And I, I'm talking about the taste of coffee uh, as much as I'm talking about, you know, um, a psychedelic experience or a sexual experience or something. But with that in mind, I still feel strongly that my most um, trusty and most agile way of expressing these things is true words. And also I have enough trust in the consciousness of the other, of the reader to know that they'll have, if even if they haven't had the same experience as me that I want to this convey, describe, they'll have had something in their own experience, something that kind of chimes with it a little bit. And so I have to trust that when they'll read it, if I do it well enough, if I do it carefully and exactly and intensely enough, then they will be able to kind of reconstruct it on the basis of whatever proportion of their experience chimes with whatever it is that I'm trying to convey. Mm. Do, do you, on the, when you're writing, obviously you have the, um, you have the luxury of being able to re-edit and go over and over to make sure that that sentence, that chapter, that word has the exact impact that you're looking for. But obviously in spoken word, you know, it's a lot more literally off the tongue. Um, and so you can't really self edit as much. And I know obviously you don't really have a problem with kind of touching on taboo subjects, um, taboo in air quotes there, but do you find it more difficult to speak about those, um, subjects in person, maybe with, you know, your family, friends, close ones, or, and do you find it just easier to kind of jot it down, write it down on a page? It depends. I feel often, in speech, and I think this is why I became a writer, is that often in speech, I'm tongue-tied. You know, I can't quite articulate myself or I can't express what I want to say. And, you know, that's a frustrating experience. And then, mm. uh, so, you know, you get into this discipline of working and reworking and reworking it till you get it exactly right. And then it has this power and then people read it and then they know exactly what you meant. Uh, but that said, um, the, like some of the more taboo topics that you talk about, um, I would never talk about them with my family. You know, there's a kind of omerta, a sort of code of silence around lots of topics between me and <laughs> me and my, my family. Um, not that they would be unwilling to hear about it. I just I just feel uncomfortable talking about it. But with certain friends. Um, well, that's interesting. Yeah. And I think, again, if you think about the, the pressures and the factors that form a writer, that turn a person into a writer, I think the silences are part of it too. And the silences that can um, stop you from expressing yourself within a family configuration or something like that. But that said, you know, I have certain friendships where kind of nothing is off limits conversationally, you know, or um, even often in kind of romantic relationships, I will have this outlet where I can say what I want to say, to, you know. So I'm, I'm, it's not that I'm living in a kind of a strict dichotomy between putting it all down on the page and never talking about it in real life. It's somewhere in between. Mm. Uh, Rob, in Threshold, Rob seems quite isolated <laughs> very often. And I wonder, do you think that the kind of author lifestyle can um, increase the possibilities of feelings of um, disconnection from other people? Yeah, um, yeah, it can. It can. Um, of course, um, I would, I just absolutely no way would hold up my kind of model of life as as in any way uh, sane or it works for me uh, which no, is yeah, to say yeah. you know it doesn't work for me at all it's completely dysfunctional <laughs> and yeah it's kind of i'm at home in that dysfunctionality uh but i and and i think that threshold is among other things um a document a record of a period of life that was um it really exceptionally lonely actually um and fraught and difficult and w with peaks in between with highs you know of of intimacy of connection of friendship of relation but essentially quite lonely quite isolated and um yeah i do think it's of course it's a it's a, a, 
occupational hazard, you know? I mean, it's interesting for me at the moment because, of course, as we record this, the whole world or 80% of it or whatever is forced to live uh, some version of my life, uh, which is staying at home all day and uh, not not really being around anybody at all because we're in this self-isolation, social distance, quarantine. And, um, Mm. uh, you know, when it's when I have certain conditions in place, then I thrive in solitude. I relish it. And it doesn't really feel like a turning away from the world. Like right now, you know, it's I'm in a house on the coast and I have not seen or spoken to another person in the flesh in some weeks now. Um, and it's, fine i'm i'm doing absolutely fine you know um but i but but i don't it's funny because i i i feel solitary but i don't feel isolated i know that there are i mean it, like this conversation is nice because it gives me a chance to talk but uh there are people there you know on the end of the internet or on the end of the phone or something but i think the good thing about solitude at its best is that it's not isolation i think isolation to me it sounds fundamentally negative, dangerous, danger signs. You know, alarm bells are ringing. Whereas solitude doesn't sound, alarm bells don't ring for me when I hear solitude. Because when I think of peaceful, well, what I think of when I think of solitude is a kind of going inwards, you know, a kind of going inside, going inwards. And uh, that's at its best, that's what it is. I try not to let myself become isolated too much anymore because it's just that's the road to destruction you know and the stakes are the stakes are high mm. obviously you spent a lot of time abroad um, and i moving from seven to several different countries i was wondering have you had time to reflect on how this has impacted uh, your like long-term friendships because obviously that will change the dynamic comprehensively um not, not really, no. I, it, it kind of weirdly enough, it hasn't. Uh, I think just because the world is so interconnected now that um, mm. y- you know a lot of my friends move around. They, I have some of my close friends now, or just some of my friends are the same friends that I had when I was fifteen. Um, not all of them. I also have new friends, and uh, but. Long-term friendships have been pretty durable in my life, which I'm happy about. A friendship is something I hold in high regard. It's in my uh-huh. value system. It would rank fairly highly. And no, for whatever reason, um, my kind of rootless, drifty, uh, you know, wandering kind of life hasn't really hasn't really negatively impacted my long-term friendships too much could you would you say that the same is true of um your romantic relationships i know you've spoken um at length at times that you've kind of had this tendency for self-sabotage would you say that maybe traveling so much and having that kind of drifty um personalities that may be you know negatively impacted um, romantic relationships yeah um yeah, I would. I don't know if I would say it negatively impacted them. It just defined their parameters to some degree. Um, what was right. what was possible okay. and what wasn't, um, and what I was looking for and what I wasn't looking for, uh, and of course, what you're looking for changes over time. And what I want from all of that now isn't necessarily the same as it was ten or even five years ago. Um, but actually, to be honest, a life of perpetual drift is not something I necessarily want to, uh, to keep going with forever. You know, I, I mean, I still have these desires to see different parts of the world and live in different places. I still find that very rich, very inspiring, but, Mm. um, kind of getting that bit older and I have more of a more of a 
I, I have different impulses now, you know, and I'm starting to wonder where the hell should I be? You know, where should I, <laughs> should I, should I, should I stop somewhere? Should I just, you know, uh, well, but I, you know, to be continued, <laughs> I haven't quite, <laughs> I haven't quite figured that one out yet. Yeah. It's like a blessing and curse having so many possibilities. Well, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, but I think it could get a bit empty too, you know, and I think that's part of what the, when I talked about a crisis a couple of years ago, or let's say part of an ongoing crisis was kind of a sense that, God, you know, what, what is this going to amount to if I just keep drifting from one place or one, one, one relationship to the next? And I mean, I, I don't know, you know, uh, I don't want to sound, sound like I have made a firm conclusive decision about anything because I kind of haven't really, you know, yeah. figuring it all out uh, mm-hmm. on the fly as I go. I have, uh, I think, an exceptional, exceptional immaturity for my years. Uh, I, I never, <laughs> never really figure anything out. The only figuring out I do is li- on podcasts talking to lads like you. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, how is the lecturing going in Limerick? Is is that um? How, yeah, how's the process for you? How's the? Yeah, that's good. So I'm uh, down there, not not that, that often. And now that we're in, you know, quarantine limbo, um, I'm doing all that remotely. So um, okay. it's it's not it's it's a nice um, balance in that I don't have what you would call a, a heavy workload there. It's kind of a couple of sessions or lectures or seminars every couple of weeks or every month. Um, last year I was teaching undergrads, uh, which was very rewarding. Actually, they were they were great. They were they were they were surprisingly um, good, talented, you know. Um, and this this semester I've been teaching the postgrads, the the master students. And yeah, I find teaching rewarding in small doses, let's say. Um, I would, uh, if I had to do lots of it, I wouldn't be too happy because, you know, the old writing really does take a lot of time and energy. And, uh, yeah. you know, you, you, you don't want to siphon off too much of that time and energy to other things. And so I, you know, a little goes a long way as far as I'm concerned. And is it strange? teaching a course on on creative writing when if i'm right you haven't necessarily undergone a creative writing course yourself is what i'm right in saying that yeah yeah sure um no it's not it's not so strange it's just that i would tend to try to bring to the students some some variant of the experience that helped to turn me into a writer which okay like you say was not necessarily it wasn't going to creative writing uh schools or masters or anything like that it was kind of studying studying at the feet of the greats really which is studying reading rereading lots of great texts lots of great books and trying to figure out how to do it and so when i teach courses or even you know day even in courses or one-off seminars or whatever the case may be i will kind of refer it always to that i'll just try to kind of have a look at some great writing with students and talk about it and then try to emulate that and try to kind of just share some of that enthusiasm and try to get students to feel the, the same passion and then write from that place of invention and it, the plan is to do it for the foreseeable future until things change uh yeah kind of uh well with limerick you mean i think i'm down you see what i'm doing there is um it's a phd fellowship which means Ah, um so it's called the kate o'brien fellowship which essentially means that i write my next the plan is anyway that i write my next book under their auspices uh while doing some teaching Ah. for them yeah so that lasts Ah, Yeah, so that lasts for three to four years, um, and next year will be the third year, and then the. So, uh, I'll see whether it takes three or four years, but uh, 
it's just nice. It, it kind of it, it makes me a living in the meantime and gives me the kind of structure that I can use to write a book. After that, I really don't know. Who knows? You know. Mm, mm. Jim, are there any more questions that we that you want to ask? Just no. I'm just wary of the signal. That's all. Yeah, no, Rob, this has been great. Thanks a million. <laughs> I love yeah. questions. Oh, good. No, um, Rob. Well, let, just before we let you go, um, if you could just give us one top tip, or what it doesn't have to be one; it can be many um, that you use to help get your shit together when you're feeling down or going through a bit of a rough patch. Yeah, uh, I would say, I mean, a couple of things, they're so mundane and so obvious that I'm almost embarrassed to say them. And yet they're what works, uh, what worked for me. And the first one is very simple, but it's uh, to talk to a mate, you know, Um, it's kind of what I do. Mm. Uh, There are a couple of, if you've got people, I think if you have even three, four or five people in your life, be they friends or family who you really trust, you know, who you can really open up to. Who have your best interests um, at heart, you, you, you're doing fine. And um, yeah. so I would say open up conversations with those about whatever it is that's grinding you down or obsession. Another thing, would be, you know, what I tend to do um, is I leave the phone. Uh, I leave the phone at home and I go for a long walk. I mean, it's nice at the moment because I'm on the coast so I can go out to the beach. But I think my whatever uh, fragile uh, filament of sanity I have is dependent upon me leaving the phone at home for, for a few, a couple of an hour or two every day and getting out there. Um, I, I don't know how you lads mm. are about social media, but I, I think the, the great like uh, cause of so much mental agony and turmoil these days is unacknowledged social media addiction and all the um, ravages to go with addiction. So um, for me, yeah. kind of s- radically limiting that is uh, is how I stay sane. Like what I'm um, just one of these days, probably in the next few days, I'm going to ask my friend uh, Andy to take my Twitter password, change it <laughs> so that I'm locked out. He's, you know, I have done it before and uh, then I probably won't log in for another six or nine months now that i've kind of used it to uh, promote my book i'll just vanish into the shadows again for a while and that's something i'd recommend people do if they can i know wow twitter it's a, lovely. twitter is a machine and, and ha- to make people miserable you know <laughs> <laughs> and has andy ever uh, po- tweeted something that you didn't uh, approve of Christ, no! If he did, that would be uh, that would, he would be the wrong man for the job. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully, Andy will retweet us when we uh, release this on our social media. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he will. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Oh, well, thanks so much for your time, Rob. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, um, and hopefully, we do this again in four years' time when you've written another book and you're somewhere else on your journey. Absolutely. Hopefully, the next one won't take me four years. But it was a great pleasure to talk to you, lads. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks a million, Rob. Cheers. All the best. Cheers. All the best. And that was Rob Doyle. Hope you enjoyed listening, guys. And please like, subscribe. And share to whoever you think might enjoy this podcast also. All the best, guys.